We are thrilled to welcome Jean Case to the stage. Jean is the chairman of the National Geographic Society and CEO of the Case Impact Network and Case Foundation. She's been at the forefront of impact investing, particularly in diverse entrepreneurs outside of the obvious hubs. And we're delighted to have her moderate a discussion on investing for equity with two of our solar teams, Gary Cooper, co-founder and CEO of Ripley, and Priya Lahani, founder and CEO of Century Tech. Please welcome them to the stage. And after that, stay on for a closing word from Alex and a great musical performance. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hala. And hello, Solve at MIT. It's such a joy to be with you this morning and especially to have these two very special people with me that I will introduce in just a minute. So I'm Jean Case. I'm chairman of the National Geographic Society and CEO of the Case Impact Network. Now, my guess is some of you know a thing or two about what National Geographic does, but what you may not know that touches on our subject today is that for some number of years now, we've actually had entrepreneurs as part of our Explorer class. Our explorers are out there addressing the critical challenges of our world on so many fronts, just like the two entrepreneurs we're gonna be talking to today. At the Case Impact Network, we've been very focused on equity and impact. We wanna see a more inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem, which I think again is represented in our guests today. Um, but more importantly, we just believe that there's a huge opportunity to more fully use business and capital as powerful forces for good. So I think we're gonna hit on some of those subjects today and I sort of wanna get right to it if it's okay. So we have two true innovators and change makers. But for purposes of today, we'll call them two brilliant solvers. <laughs> and I think you'll be interested in hearing what they're doing in each of their companies to address challenges across the society and to use startups as real change making opportunities. So uh, we have Dr. Gary Cooper with us, who is founder and CEO of Reapley. You can see he's wearing the brand, he's sporting the <laughs> brand today. <laughs> and we have Priya Lakani. And Priya is founder and CEO of Century. And I'm gonna let them speak for themselves about what the organizations do, but I think you'll agree with me. You'll see the change they're making in this world and the kind of solvers that they are. We'll call Gary a circular economy solver and we'll call Priya an education solver. But I wanna open it up first. Priya, if you can talk for just a bit about what your company Century does and give the audience some idea about what you're focused on these days. Thanks so much, Jean, and thanks so much for having me uh, here today. So I really was looking at trying to solve two problems, uh, and I think it's really important to start with the problems you're trying to solve rather than sort of retrofitting some idea of technology to a particular sector. The two problems I was trying to solve in education were that we still have the one-size-fits-all delivery of education in so many schools around the world. Education really hasn't transformed too much from when you and I went to school. They've gone from a blackboard to an interactive whiteboard. And every single child deserves a differentiated and personalised education. The second issue that I wanted to solve is that in many parts of the world, we have a huge teacher workload issue. Teachers often spend 60, that's over half, 60% of their time on admin, micro-marking, micro-assessing, trying to figure out where an inter intervention is necessary in a the classroom. They're often spending more time not doing what they signed up to do, which is why eight years ago, when I started Century, it was really no surprise that three quarters of teachers in England considered qu quitting the profession um, in the next three years. So that's like headline news. So what we did was we went away and thought, how can we try and solve those two problems? And it happened to be that technology has obviously transformed every sector of the world. Education was very slow to change with technology, but it could really help in those two areas. If we combine artificial intelligence, so here I'm talking about machine learning and deep learning, so neural networks and creating a content agnostic system, combine that with neuroscience and learning science to essentially learn how we learn. So a machine where Gene, if you spent two minutes on the machine, it will start to learn your behaviours in education. It could then take whatever curriculum you're studying and personalise for you. So it's really about using the technology to provide that personalised, differentiated education. But at the same time, because AI goes hand in hand with big data, we can use big data analysis to then provide real time, instant, deep insights to teachers and educators to avoid that 60% of time spent micro marking, micro planning and assessing. 
and allow them to make those timely targeted interventions so that we can start to see an improvement in outcomes. So we started eight years ago after a couple of years of a lot of research, including me doing nano degrees in AI and all sorts of things. I'm a former barrister, a trial court attorney. I had no idea about any of this. So if anyone's wondering if they can be a tech entrepreneur and not be a coder, you know, living example and proof of that. But, but Jean, it was very much how can we improve education for all across the globe, increase social mobility using technology in this particular way. That's terrific. And I, I actually want to delve a little bit more into it, but we have time for some, some additional questions on that front. All right. So, Gary, in full disclosure to our audience, my husband has an investment firm and he has an effort called Rise of the Rest. Um, mm -hmm. and Gary recently won a pitch competition and investment as the uh, equity edition winner. Um, but talk to us about Reapley. It's a really interesting company doing really interesting things. And let us know what, what's it all about. Yes, and, and I was talking with him just recently, so uh, good to meet his better half. So yeah, so what Reapley is doing is really, really simple at its core. So we help large organizations, large government systems with reuse, right? So in the market, if you think about sustainability, the canonical definition is the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycling. But really only people focus on the recycling part. And actually, recycling as a concept is quite frankly failed. In the United States right now, we recycle 10% of the available things to recycle. So it's not working. And so what we're doing at Reapley is actually doing the better part of sustainability, which is scaling reuse. And we're doing that through technology. And that is all hopes in helping scale our transition to a low carbon circular economy. If I could just take one quick moment and kind of talk a little bit about circular economy, it's the only thing I think about all day long. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which we're happy to be a part of, uh, put out a white paper a couple of years ago that showed that even if we were to move to a completely green electrical grid, right? So if we greened all transport, all energy sources, we still would only abate the negative effects of climate change by 55%. The other gap, the other 45%, you need to scale a circular economy. And so one of the core issues that's scaling a circular economy is where's all the stuff? Where are all the physical items? We don't have a Google for physical items. We don't know about where everything is. And thus, it's hard to circulate things that you don't know about. So what we're really doing, at least in the working world at Reefly, is we're trying to help map out where all the physical assets are in companies, in businesses, in governments, so that we can then thus circulate them around our communities to kind of get to that scale circular economy. So you're kind of like an e-harmony for things, right? You're trying to bring people yes, to see yes, things, people yes, who have yes, them, and make sure they yes. don't go to waste. Um, circular they economy, literally, I think- Literally our case. Yeah, yeah. I think circular economy is a is a really cool term. I think, you know, the term that came before it that some people are a little more familiar with is sharing economy, right? And in a sense, yes, it's an yes. like that. But Priya, yeah, I want to come exactly. back to you because um, Century isn't your first rodeo, right? You've <laughs> built some other businesses. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, uh, we know that uh, race, place, and gender are challenged in this world for entrepreneurs. We're not seeing the capital flow there for women. And I'm going to go to Gary next on this, but for women, you know, if there isn't a male founder, only 2% of venture capital in the United States went to women only led funds. Um, and I know you're in the UK, but I don't think it's all that different in the it's, UK. It's just, it's just that little bit worse, I'm afraid. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> 1%. So, as I yeah. said, I mean, this isn't your first company. So, you know, share with us kind of a little bit about your your journey and maybe anything that can be an inspiration or lesson learned that might help those thinking about taking their own ideas forward into new companies or just getting started now. Gosh, well, that's very flattering. I mean, I, I hope it's inspirational. Um, so, uh, I, uh, <laughs> so, my first company uh, was I was the sort of child who sold uh, candy bars at the back of the netball courts for a small profit to my friends. Uh, so um, awesome. uh, we have a candy bar called, uh, I'm calling it candy because you're from the US, but a chocolate bar <laughs> called a chomp, a chomp bar. And I used to make three pence for every chomp bar. And then I realized if I scaled to Kearney Whirlies, I don't know if you have them there, they're a bit longer and bigger. I made seven pence per bar. So I scaled to Kearney Whirlies. Um, but I was quite entrepreneurial as, as a child, actually. An older brother, he got a car 
we used to go to the auction houses over here and in the auction houses you could bid, bid on uh, new but unsold Costco stock you might, I think you have Costco there right it's yep. pretty big and so I used to buy video cameras tag royal watches paddling pools you name it we had it in our parents garage then we do something really naughty Jean and we would go to Costco and I was a bit cuter than my brother at that age. So I'd go to Costco and I'd stand by the video cameras. And if someone came to a video camera and they were about to pick it up, I'd tap on their shoulder and say, excuse me, sir, I've got one in the back of my car. And we, we would make a profit. <laughs> and, so, and then we took our um, funds and we invested them into stocks and shares and the plot stocks and shares. So we were pretty entrepreneurial. But my background is that my family's from East Africa. So we spent most of our summers and winters in Kenya. And so it was a real sort of, change of scenery to be in a really leafy part of the northwest of, of England and then turn up to a place where you have servants right and so the idea was look I want to change the world for, for these people for the underprivileged those without you know food with that nutrition healthcare, and education and so I sort of found my purpose at a very young age and decided mm. that I wanted to change the world sounds really cliche but one of the luckiest people in the world to figure out at the age of six that that's what I wanted to do um, went through life and thought equity and justice is surely all about becoming a lawyer. <laughs> I was quite naive. Uh, and I decided that that's what I would do. And then actually, as a lawyer, I loved my role um, I was, as a barrister, but it wasn't quite changing the world when I was an adult as I thought I would. So I spotted a gap in the market, uh, you know, when I was working late nights and there was not much fresh ethnic food on the supermarket shelf. So if you went to your Whole Foods, there were lots of fresh pasta and fresh pasta sauces. But there were no fresh ethnic sources and I'm Indian and I needed to cheat and create fresh Indian meals for my new mother-in-law and it wasn't quite working for me so I created Masala Masala I saw a gap in the market and it was really about trying to you know when people are thinking of these ideas is there something you're stumbling across yourself is there something you want to improve or make better if you hear Gary's inspirational story well everyone thinks that recycling is working but actually is it so you know is there something we can do in this other space sparking off ideas then essentially just I researched all of these areas I really wanted to run my own thing so Jean it was very much I also wanted to create a company and an environment where people love to work where I was investing in them in the whole idea this whole idea that people want to be invested in what they are doing um, and find purpose and so Masala Masala was great it was profit making from year one it was all my own, own money it, you know it was a small business but I was with the money I was funding schools I was providing pentavalent five-in-one vaccines in Africa and I was providing hot meals for every unit of products sold here so in the first year we did three million hot meals yeah. problem is, that's when I found out education has so many problems and I thought what's the point of funding schools in former commonwealth countries based on a British system when the British system doesn't work let's fix the fundamentals in the system hence founded century yeah, that's great and that's the way to do it. That's great. Um, Gary, you know, I that was a good example of gender and obviously, you know, sort of race and geography played in her story as well. But you're in Chicago, right? Yes. And I think you know this data, but in the US last year, 75% of venture capital went to just three places, New York, Massachusetts, and California, with the vast yes. majority of that going to California just by itself, right? Mm -hmm. So there you are sitting in the middle of the country in the nation's heartland, sort of. Um, and you're building a company. Talk to me about, you know, what you've seen in terms of your experience of an entrepreneur in the middle of the country, where often we don't associate, you know, even though the majority of our Fortune 500 companies were founded between the coasts, you know, mm -hmm. Americans think all the innovations, innovation is on, on the coast. So what's it been like, you know, building this company in Chicago and what role does place play as you build your company? Yeah, it's such a great question. And by the way, I have to comment, I feel like I should go do a thousand pushups after what Priya just said, I mean, isn't that just so inspirational? I was like, what am I going to do with my whole life? Um, but no, it's such a great question, Gene. I mean, um, it has been historically hard to start a high growth venture back company in places like Chicago, places like Kansas City, places like Cincinnati and others uh, throughout the Midwest. And it's because of a couple of the underlying reasons that you say, which is, you know, there's less funding here. In fact, even around my last funding round, I talked to I think at least two investors who asked me, where are you? And I said, Chicago, they're like, not interested. Or they said, immediate, even in COVID, they said, hey, if, you're, if you're not in the Bay Area, like, we don't even have to have this call. Like, I'm just not interested. Right. So, you know, there is that classic fight of, hey, we, we're building great companies here in Chicago. Um, but the other is that um, the network, right? So um, 
being connected to the right people at the right time is sometimes as valuable to a founder, especially who's getting started, as the dollar that they need to kind of get started. And so I think what I can say that I've, I've been blessed to have um, in Chicago, in the Midwest, is I've been able to develop a really, really, really strong network of CEOs at Fortune 500 companies, some of which are our customers, um, of, of civic and, and policy leaders, of the academic uh, leaders, um, and of government, federal government leaders, all here in Chicago. So while we have historically struggled, I think, from having the VC network here in Chicago, although I think that's improving, um, I think what we do have is a lot of love, a lot of willingness to work together, um, and especially kind of in the Rust Belty, in the heartland, a right. lot of businesses around supply chain and logistics, Reaply at its core is solving a logistics supply chain problem. So I think there are some, some benefits to starting here in Chicago, but for sure there are some historic uh, negatives, not to mention the fact about being a black founder um, in tech space. I think in, uh, in Chicago, I know, there was an article that came up that said only nine black folks Ever had raised over a million dollars in VC money in the city of Chicago, which is, um, I think, last quarter, $2 billion of VC money was raised by Chicago founders. Right. So if you just think about that, that well, is we know in the nation, problem. it's 1% of venture capital that has exactly black founders. Yeah. So but I want to ask you about that. I mean, we talked yeah. about race, place, and gender. And so, yeah. and particularly, I'd love for you if you can just reflect for a minute on. You know what we've been through as a nation in the last year not even to mention in recent weeks um, yeah but have you felt any of the temperature change have you felt an opening more inclusivity more openness on the part of investors uh what are you seeing out there yeah no i mean this is we're living through a moment and sometimes when you're living through that moment it, you can run away from it or you can be like oh my god hopefully something is changing and and I've been one of those people writing and speaking um, as much as I possibly can, uh, even though it's not my day job to bring light to that. It's like we are changing and that should be celebrated. So what I see on the ground level um, since the, the horrific events uh, following George Floyd's, uh, leading up to George Floyd's death yeah. is really two part. The first is I can certify that traditional VCs are definitely making efforts to have more conversations with women founders, with founders of color, with immigrant, just non-traditional founders in general. Um, it's the, the jury's still out if that leads to more investment dollars and more deals. But I can definitely say, at least for my friends and, and peers, that it is easier to get a, a, a meeting or two um, these days. What I can also say is in Chicago, especially, there are funds who have now uh, started that are specifically um, investing in diverse founders or sometimes called founders under, underrepresented or under network founders. In fact, I'm a founding partner in one here in Chicago called Long Jump, longjump.vc. And essentially what we're doing is for first time founders who are under network or underrepresented, who live in Chicago, we wanna be the first check for, for those awesome. founders. And there are, I think three other funds like it that have that have that have uh, uh, been launched in Chicago just since George Floyd's awesome. death. So really I think there is a good march to more progress. Yeah. So we really have to start to wrap it up. I want to go to you with some really a final question for both of you. We're coming off of a tough year. We just talked about the George Floyd murder and and the impacts in the United States. And Priya, I know you're sitting in the UK, but we know that had a global shock. Um, Absolutely. But yep. you know, then on top of that, of course, we've been going through a global pandemic. So. You know, as founders, as leaders, as entrepreneurs trying to carry companies forward in a very challenging time, what do you want to tell folks out there who are trying to take their own ideas forward in this, you know, really challenging window? Quickly, what like what are a couple things you've just really learned or would want to pass on? And Priya, I'll start with you. Thanks so much. So I've had a fair amount of experience of coming to the US and, and speaking to investors. And, and um, you know, what Gary was saying is, is, is so true in terms of what we often experience as a female founder, you know, harassment, um, female ethnic minority founder. And um, sometimes it doesn't quite sit right with you. So, you know, but look, if you're looking at starting a business and, and yes, you can look at the statistics and you can become paralyzed by the statistics. Of course you can. You know, it doesn't sound great, but Hey, I've been told my whole life, there's just no way you're going to achieve X or you're not going to go there. 
the reason why most people will fail and they won't get to where you want to get to is because they don't persevere enough and they're not resilient enough. If you persevere, persevere, knock down those barriers. But venture capital, they need deal flow. They need the deals as much as you need the money, all right? So if you have enough founders in the Midwest, right, enough founders everywhere with good ideas and you persevere and you persevere and you, you are resilient and you just accept the rejection, take the feedback, change approach a bit, go again, go again, don't stop. They will come because they want the deal. They want to make money. They want that home run deal. So it's, it's you know, we, we hear the stats and we can't deny them. I'm totally with you on that, but it hasn't stopped me raising over 12 million, right? I'm proud to say I'm an MIT investee now as well. I mean, I've got MIT um, the SIF on our cap table. It's because we do not stop. So if you've got an idea and it's a solver type idea and it's worth it because it's got purpose at its heart, it's about changing the world. It's about working beyond the betterment of yourself. You cannot afford to just be paralyzed by statistics. Just don't be one of them. Right. And the idea, there are plenty of ways. So perseverance and resilience, Jean, are just the key things that I think that new founders, new people you know, who want to start up, they have to focus and they have to persevere. And I think then you can get there. You'll end up with the right advice, with the right mentors, with the right funders. Uh, and it will be a fantastic story you'll be able to tell. Great. Thanks for that, Priya. Great charge out there to the audience. OK, Gary. Yeah, just quickly, I completely agree with her. I always say start and don't stop to founders. Um, uh, I'll just quickly say, talking about the sharing economy, uh, Airbnb and Uber were started when? At the last market downturn. Uh, those are public companies now. I'm, a, I'm actually an investor in both. I would say to founders all out there, start and don't stop and realizing that because of the massive shift that just happened because of COVID, because of the things that are intimating because of race relations, and because of the oncoming of climate change, this is a massive opportunity to start businesses right now, no matter who you are. So start that business today. If it's just writing it on a piece of paper or whatever stage you're at, I would say start and don't stop. Well, I think you've both said it beautifully. You know, I might say it as be fearless, which I think you both encompass mm -hmm. in what you were talking about, because the stories of entrepreneurs everywhere, including the two we've heard from today, is that perseverance, right? Is overcoming challenge, challenges and using sometimes these hard moments as great opportunities, as you pointed out to Gary. So we wanna thank our audience for being with us. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, Gary, not just for this, thank but you. for what you guys do every day. Thank we're you. cheering thank you, you on and we wish you all success. Thanks, thank everyone. You,